kiddos. I've got your test results right here. They're written in Jazzberry Jam Crayon, and also you're sick, and we'll talk about it later. But until then, my name is Dr. Jordan Breeding, and when I was your age, I was making silly videos just like this. <laughs> wow, can you imagine me still doing some stupid crap like that? Well, look at me now, Mom. Anyway, you're watching another kid-tested, mother-approved episode of Your Brain on Crack, the show where I attempt to make you cry harder than Pixar, and the only show on crack rated PG for frightening and intense sequences. <laughs> Were you scared? Tell me honestly. No, shut up. We have to move on. Today I diagnose... The best kids' movies always throw in a little something for the adults, and I'm not just talking about cartoon rabbits hand-drawn to ruin marriages. Sometimes that means a couple of adult-oriented jokes sandwiched between the endless fart gags, but other times it means dealing with more complex emotional themes like sadness or loss. By that same token, some kids' movies hide little fun bits of utterly depressing horror only noticeable by somebody old enough to recognize that real life is full of tragedy and we are all just inches from death, kids. <laughs> The Toy Story saga has always strove to make me feel guilty for throwing away my old crappy toys. If Pixar got their way, our childhood dolls would be right alongside us for every major life development, like graduations or weddings or honeymoons. Benson. Oh, oh. Uh... And that's why audiences were so upset with the way Sid tortured and reassembled toys like a little Dr. Frankenstein with braces. But thanks to 2010's most terrifying horror film, Toy Story 3, we now know that Sid wasn't just physically abusing his toys, he was actually throwing them into terrifying existential crises. In Toy Story 3, Mrs. Potato Head looks through her detached eye to see Andy getting ready for college and packing just like a thousand Magnum condoms, <gasps> even though the eye is no longer attached to her body. Similar to whichever politician I could reference to make you the most angry, toys and their parts don't require fully functioning nervous systems. Yeehaw! Additionally, Slinky Dog's butt sometimes goes rogue on him, forcing Slink to argue with his anus like an old man without ready access to laxatives. In the Toy Story universe, body parts can work independently of their primary host, so what happens when you stick one part onto another toy? Which toy part gains the most control in that scenario? Is that baby head fighting an unending mental battle with its erector set legs for dominance? Is there a twisted spider-headed American Girl doll creature lurking around somewhere else in the house fighting an internal war between its desperate body parts? <laughs> All this body horror points to another frightening fact about Toy Story toys. They're immortal. If they can survive extreme dismemberment and being grafted into butt-to-mouth toy centipedes, they can pretty much survive anything. Remember how Lotso gets hilariously tied to the grade of that dump truck as punishment for his sins? If I wanna keep your mouth shut. Oh. Well, he'll be trapped there for God knows how many years, his fuzzy flesh slowly being torn away by the wind until finally he's chucked into a landfill to live out eternity in claustrophobic darkness. We're all just trash waiting to be thrown away. That's all a toy is. <laughs> By the time of the movie Cars, humans are clearly extinct, possibly as a result of a war with these sentient murder machines that can also motorboat you. <laughs> Humanity has been replaced by these anthropomorphic vehicles who have a society that mirrors ours. I mean, there are judges, waitresses, and even creepy little freaks. Well, what'd you think? I just snuck in here when nobody was looking and pretended to be a waiter? The freakiest freak is the tow truck Mater, voiced by Larry the Cable Guy doing a heightened country accent that sounds like a man being slowly choked to death behind a cracker barrel. And Mater's job is towing destroyed cars to the junkyard, which makes him the de facto town mortician. We know vehicles die in this universe because Mater clearly unceremoniously chucks cars into mass graves. And it's possible that some cars receive proper burials, but which ones? Does Mater only dispose of the poor sad cars who couldn't pay for a proper funeral? I mean, he does seem like a stickler when it comes to money. You owe me $32,000 in legal fees. But that's not all, because Mater's business is called towing and salvage. First you find a can from a rusty van bump bump. If you can't afford to buy your beautiful Hyundai Sonata wife a new spark plug, at least you can rest easy in the knowledge that the star of Larry the Cable Guy Health Inspector will dig through her corpse to see if her brake pads are decent enough to shove into some rando's chassis. And cars require constant maintenance, so possibly every single person in the car's universe is powered by their dead friend's dismembered parts recovered from a mountain of discarded corpses. Ma, I was wondering when you was gonna wake up. Take whatever you want, just don't hurt me. Lilo and Stitch is a movie about a girl who really sucks at properly identifying animals. What is that thing? A dog, I think? Before she misidentifies the blue alien as a regular blue dog, Lilo misidentifies a fish named Pudge as a weather god? 
Pudge controls the weather. Obviously, one of Lilo's classmates calls her crazy because kids can be mean, and, and also Lilo is very clearly crazy. My friends need to be punished. It's not like she's getting any snow days in Hawaii, so what does the little girl even gain from currying the favor of some weather god, fish or otherwise? Well, for starters, it might protect the people Lilo loves from dying. Oh! See, Lilo is an orphan living with her older sister. Their parents were killed in a car crash during inclement weather. Lilo is now constantly afraid that she, or somebody she loves, will be similarly taken during a rainstorm. Her little kid brain is doing whatever it can to reestablish some control in her life. In this instance, that means feeding peanut butter sandwiches to a fish named Pudge, but honestly, that's definitely at least middle tier as far as religions go. She's not just some cult leader making it up as she goes either. She's clearly thought things through enough to realize that Pudge shouldn't eat tuna because, you know, cannibalism. And her thoroughness really just makes the whole thing way sadder and way more depressing. If I gave Pudge tuna, I'd be an abomination! <laughs> The ending of the Iron Giant isn't exactly happy, but it is hopeful. The giant has exploded, sure, but his friend Hogarth does get to keep possession of a leftover iron bolt as a memento of his fallen friend. I miss him. And yeah, I guess it's a little weird because if the Iron Giant was a human, that'd be the equivalent of like a finger or a pancreas, but he's not a human, so it's weak. Even better, later that night, the bolts seem to be moving, implying that the giant's various pieces are slowly coming back together just in time for Vin Diesel's return in Two Iron, Two Giant, Tokyo Drift. We were drift compatible. But you know who won't return for a sequel? Hogarth. Because he'll be dead. Oh my god. Hogarth holding onto a little piece of his buddy's corpse is a really nice thought, except for the fact that it was completely bathed in radiation. Radiation from nuclear catastrophe stays on scrap metal for a very, very long time. We're experiencing a worldwide problem right now where metal used in military or industrial hardware has been melted down and reused, but the dangerous radiation lives on. In 2005, Taiwanese residents living in apartments made of this reused metal saw a massive increase in leukemia and breast cancer. Again, this is reused and refined metal decades after the fact. Hogarth receives that bolt hours after it survives a direct nuclear explosion. If he doesn't die from radiation poisoning, he has about a 100% chance of developing premature cancer. So if you weren't already weeping at the ending of the Iron Giant, maybe picturing a bald Hogarth blowing his make-a-wish on an early screening of The Phantom Menace will. Get out of here! Uh, Satan. Jungle Book villain Shere Khan may look like a tiger who is maybe also an MMA fighter, but honestly, he's a pretty reasonable dude. When he makes his entrance in 2016's live-action Jungle Book, he doesn't just start tearing koala bears to shreds. He actually lays out a solid, well-thought-out argument for why Mowgli has to go. Shift your hunting ground for a few years and everyone forgets how the law works. Well, let me remind you, a man-cub becomes man, and man is forbidden! So the wolf pack isn't just making questionable life choices, they're actual jungle criminals. When Shere Khan kills Akila, he's only carrying out the law of the land. If his last name was Van Dam, we'd be rooting for him all the way. But of course, Shere Khan's real flaw is not appreciating how Mowgli's just an innocent kid, and he could be raised to respect nature, right? Right. Well, except for the fact that Mowgli uses his human advantage to steal a torch from a nearby village and burn down the whole freaking jungle. Mowgli kills Khan and presumably hundreds of other more lovable, cuddly creatures by doing the one disastrous thing the tiger was trying to prevent. In Shere Khan's mind, sacrificing a few wolves to save the entire jungle is worth it. But in Mowgli's mind, burning down the entire jungle so he can, I guess, stay in the jungle and just never wear pants is worth it. I'm gonna be like you. Okay, yeah, so built a new religion around a fish named Pudge, made Mater the tow truck our Satan, and determined that forgotten toys are the despondent sinners doomed to weeping and gnashing of their plastic teeth for unbearably painful eternity. Anyway, be sure to grab some drugs from Kathy on your way out for your measles. Ooh, I forgot about those. I forgot we were bringing them back, but what a fun throwback for the kids. Fun. Oh, oh. That was real! Hey everybody, I'm here at this location, and I hope you enjoyed that video. Please subscribe and hit the bell and do the notifications thing so that I can go to more locations like this one.